Let's hope it will work. <laughs> okay, so uh, a little bit about me. I um, work for a company. Uh, it's a Seattle-based uh, startup, in, uh, and I'm one of few uh, employees here. Uh, and we we manage the uh, customer data for our, uh, customers. Customers have many customers, so they, we are like giving them insights about their customers. Uh, do some smart machine learning and, and so on. So uh, we need to run a lot of um, uh, various uh, services, and that's why we decided and we create new one and we uh, delete the old services. Uh, we need to scale f uh, fast up and down. So containers was a very logical step for us, and uh, a part of it uh, we are running on AWS, AWS, and we are using Kubernetes in EC2 instances, so very simple setup. Um, I'm also an uh, organizer of containers meetup. I've started a uh, Docker meetup in Prague, uh, and then we moved to more community-based uh, meetup. So um, if you are interested in more uh, in, in containers in general and uh, monitoring, alerting, we do a little bit of de DevOps, then uh, I brought the advertisement on my t shirt There's a URL that where you find uh, out more, where we uh, gather, and uh, what do we do. If you want to speak or be part of community, just don't uh, wait for anything. Come directly to me. And yeah, I think that's it. So what will the talk be about? It will be about containers. I would like to, and I hope, not many people know too much about containers in this room because this is very basic uh, uh, co course about uh, what uh, are containers, how the, they evolved, what's coming next, and how you can use them as a uh, uh, developer and how you can use them as operations person. So this should be like your first talk you are getting. My friend, uh, when I told, told him I'll be giving this talk, he, sh he said, yeah, and he will call it yet another introduction to Docker. So this is the level of, uh, of the talk. Yeah. So just to make the things clear, when, I, when someone asks you, what are containers, you've been to this talk, you, so you will know exactly what containers are. So you can, what I, what I always answer, and uh, it's always right, it's uh, just saying in Linux, containers are just a fancy way to start a, a process, right? It's nothing else. It's not actually virtualization. It just, you start a, a process, and you set certain rules to it. And yeah, and we'll go a little bit deeper into it. So first, let's have a look when it all started. I don't remember this, but in 1979, there have been uh, th uh, big Unix uh, systems, and they, they thought that it might be nice that if there is a process, so for security reason, uh, you should, you sh they shouldn't be able to see each other or uh, see each other files and, and stuff, so they created Hrut. Who knew Hrut? Yeah, it's a basic, a pretty basic concept. So this is exactly what is used by uh, uh, modern containers, which is a bit uh, fancier way. So yeah, but when you're thinking about containers, it's nothing but a process. So there was a quiet while, and then in FreeBSD, they introduced Jails, which was building on the uh, root logic. It just added a few more features of like how to putting the process into jail. Uh, and in Linux, there started the first uh, namespace separation, uh, Linux vServer. Um, I think the project's not active anymore, but I'm not sure about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, anyone knows like Hrut, everyone knows Hrut, but anyone knows uh, SecComp? Yeah. Uh, well, if, if your, your process is calling uh, uh, kernel, uh, it's it can it can basically if you run as root, you can run anything uh, any any system call uh, you want. But uh, with seccomp, you can set process the way that uh, you can be a root, but you can be allowed to run only several uh, kernel calls. 
So even if you're root, you cannot uh, rule the whole uh, system from your process. Mm. Yeah, everyone loves Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then there, a uh, year later, uh, came C groups, and uh, who knows which company introduced C groups in uh, in Linux kernel? It's a little quiz. Yeah, there is a big company that used containers long before everyone else on uh, was running them on a large scale, and it's uh, Google. They weren't using the full containers. Uh, as we know them uh, nowadays, but uh, they were they were running a lot of processes. They didn't want to uh, spend money on virtualization, so that every process is just a process in their uh, ecosystem, and uh, they wanted to say, yeah, this is a process that's like I don't know Gmail, and we wanted to uh, each process should consume maximally uh, this one CPU, or it should use up to, I don't know, two gigs of RAM and and stuff like that. So the six C groups are there to uh, restrict the process from eating the resources of other processes on the same uh, same host. So anyone anyone knew or tried C groups on their own? No one? <laughs> yeah, I, I want, once was on uh, Red Hat. Uh, Training, uh, you are trying to set the C groups. It's fairly complicated way, uh, fa fairly complicated, and yeah, it works. You can imagine it. For example, if you are using uh, Postgres, uh, you start the process, and you can uh, configure Postgres to consume maximally, I don't know, uh, some amount of RAM. But what Postgres does, it's uh, it's using new process for every uh, SQL query or whatever you do. And uh, so, so if you set uh, the rule, you, you, it's, it can grow. Uh, anyway, you can use much more than you you uh, allow it for one uh, process. So if you, but if you configure the Postgres main process uh, in a C group that uh, allows only use of one or two uh, CPUs and uh, given the RAM, then all the processes that are spawned from the main process can together use just this amount of RAM, right? So that's what you do. You just get a program, uh, you set, the, uh, oh, say, OK, you can run, you can consume only maximally 2 gigs of RAM. And it, even though it spawns as many processes as, as, as it wants, it will never allow it to use more than uh, more processes than, than it is. So this is what the C groups uh, did, and they came from uh, Google. That's that's it. Yeah. And 2008, uh, namespaces were introduced. Anyone knows a little bit what namespaces are? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, so you, you got mount namespace. So for example, you can allow uh, access to some mount namespaces. You get ICP uh, namespace for. Uh, so if if you start a, a process, you allow it to uh, be only in the, uh, to, to see only in, uh, networking devices that you allow it to see. It will not see uh, anything else, so it cannot mount uh, other uh, file systems. Um, yeah, there are about six, seven uh, namespaces. We'll not go through all of them, but that's basically, it's just another level of uh, like restricting or jailing the process. Uh, I realize I, <laughs> I I didn't include SC Linux. This uh, also very very big part of maybe because um, yeah I, I like it. Uh, it's a camera. Uh, everyone uses this set and uh, yeah. It's SC Linux as well as well and Ab Ab Armor are big parts of uh, containerization and security and stuff. Uh, and uh, 2013, it's already four years ago, Docker was open sourced. And uh, what was the cool thing about Docker uh, was that it took all those complicated things you don't even know about or don't even care about 
and it made it very simple to uh, start the process the way you want to start it. So, for example, C groups, as I was saying, it's it's a hell, at least for me, to configure uh, rules for the process uh, to to be restricted on certain um, IOPS uh, to to disk or. Uh, mem memory it can use this uh, given, uh, yeah, <laughs> given uh, resources that it can consume, um, and Docker just did Docker run, and you, you could say just error mi uh, minus error and uh, five gigs or four gigs of RAM, and uh, CPU you just say which uh, CPUs can be used or how how big portion of CPU the, the process can can use or how much of CPU time it can use. And uh, and you can start the process with this uh, restrict uh, re uh, restrictions very easily. So yeah. By the way, maybe I'm like, talking too long. Do I have some time tracking? Where you're tracking me? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I had it before and it didn't work. It sucks. It's just stupid. So. So what are uh, containers? Uh, as we said, it's just a single process with certain rules. So for example, in kernel, you never have notion of a container. It's always just a list of uh, certain rules that you apply to a certain pro uh, to given process. Uh, and uh, what's what? So you have all these features and what it means actually. So what? Uh, makes container container when when it starts uh, being a container, so it can uh, like because you have crude, you can have for every process you get uh, uh, all the libraries that comes with it. You you, you deploy it with with the co uh, container. It's a Docker image uh, that contains that's basically a tar of, of files that you. Explode or untar on on your file system and run run them. So it can you can have a operating uh, system. Uh, I don't know Fedora, and you can download the Docker image or uh, container image uh, that's called that has Ubuntu or uh, Arch Linux, uh, Alpine Linux, whatever, and you can run these containers on the same machine. Uh, so, so yeah. does it make sense? <laughs> so, yeah. So, once you create a container image, it contains all all the uh, libraries, everything that you want it to run. So. The cool thing about it is that you're trying something on on your laptop. So you download uh, Ubuntu uh, image, you use it, you say, okay, this configuration works. So you just pack it, push it, and then someone else can try it. You can then run it on the CI. You can run it even in production, and it always has the same library, same files, same dependencies. So shouldn't happen that you will have uh, something working on your laptop, right? And it will not be working in production. It's just a matter of different configuration. So that's a consistency. Yeah. And yeah, I think I basically covered these things. Yeah. And uh, I'm a little bit skipping between uh, Docker uh, and containers, uh, and it's important to point out that Docker is not the only containerization uh, platform or the way. Uh, so, in 2013, it was the best, most suitable way to run containers was a Docker, uh, but we moved on since then, and uh, now there are much more ways. Uh, you can I only talk deeply about other, uh, but you should you should you should know that uh, there are other ways uh, to run system containers because sometimes you want to run containers, but 
uh, when you have Docker, you have very big fat uh, binary, one binary that does all the things. And when you want just simple part of it, you, uh, for example, for your system, you have, uh, I don't know, Fedora, and you want to uh, run some application that is packaged just for Debian, you don't want to care about like porting it to or implementing it might be difficult. So you just take the image that's uh, for uh, the uh, that's packaged container image, and uh, you can run it on your Fedora machine, and you don't have to care what binaries it has because it brought everything uh, with it. So, yeah, we spoke about uh, VMs. Uh, so here you can uh, see graphically like what's the actual difference between virtual machines and uh, uh, containers. Oh, it's a very small picture. So here obviously is a, a virtual machine and here's a, a container. It's smaller, it's better, right? <laughs> so what, what's, the, what's the difference about it? Uh, that you got normally some uh, hardware layer, then you have some operating system or some uh, yeah, just operating system. Then you have a hypervisor, and in the uh, in the case of uh, Docker, you got the container engine, which is the service that's running same like uh, hypervisor. But you don't actually need to have service running. You can just run con command to create the, this uh, container with, the, with the, just the process with uh, given the rules, and then you can uh, stop the uh, stop the process. And uh, then when you have hypervisor, you need to start a new uh, virtual, when you start virtual machine, it starts booting. It starts the process of starting. It takes one, two minutes, depends on what, what you are starting. And then you got uh, binaries, libraries, and uh, the application itself. So if you want to scale a, library, uh, a virtual machine, it takes some time. It takes the operating system can take some RAM or CPU for just running there, and that's the biggest difference uh, between containers and uh, virtual machines. That if you have got um, Docker or Linux container, you got just these binaries that is a con uh, whole can be whole. Uh, the bin all the binaries can be whole operating system like Debian. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes you just created, for example, Golang. You get single bi or Rust or whatever. You get single binary that you want to deploy and run, right? So you don't need almost anything else. You get just some basic bash, and and the image can have up to I don't know, 20 megabytes or whatever. So it can be very fast to deploy, very fast to start, very fast to scale, and uh, everything. Yeah. And even if you start the application and you have all the dependencies of the uh, operating system, you, you don't have to start the uh, operating system. You don't have to start Ubuntu. You don't have to start uh, CentOS, whatever. You just uh, start a container that uh, spawns of only one process, which can be Bash, which can be whatever application you're running. Any questions to that? It's usually a big difference. Good, so it's pretty clear. Mm. So let's move on. So once you got this uh, system, what what does the life with containers uh, look look like, or what should it look like? So when you got uh, uh, assignment, you should write a uh, application, right? So when you write the application, usually. Uh, say, okay, I'll need some dependencies, so uh, you'll install them on your host uh, or on your laptop, uh, and then you're writing up, adding some uh, libraries, maybe some are uh, outdated, you, you update them, whatever, and then you say, okay, I got it, you deploy it, and just say, okay, it doesn't work on my laptop, so you have to go and you have to investigate, or maybe someone was... Uh, not very nice, so he wrote down uh, what, what dependencies you need for uh, this application. But in the case of the Docker, you just uh, write your application, uh, and once you're done, or while you are doing it, you can uh, create a container image that contains all these applications and test it locally, with in, uh, like with this uh, Docker container. 
or whatever container you're using. And uh, when you want to move on, you want to put it to testing, you want to, or maybe a colleague need to write some features, you just give him the uh, either instructions how to create a container, or you can, you can just uh, send him the entire container. It will just do uh, exactly the same. He will do Docker run, and he will run your application uh, the same, yeah. Uh, same way you do, do, and it should, it always works, or at least it's much better than, I don't know, uh, I spent countless hours on like trying to uh, build uh, some custom projects uh, from, from GitHub, and it took me ages to get uh, all the dependencies right on my machine. So nowadays, you usually when you go GitHub, every pro project has its own Docker file. So all you need to do, you just do Docker, uh, Docker build uh, and the uh, Docker, Docker file path, and it just builds the application for, for you in the way the users or the authors of the application intended. So yeah, I'm booting to custom project. So. It, Imagine you're an uh, employee in a new company, <laughs> and uh, I have uh, once worked in a company, and it was uh, very good when you managed to start your application in under a week, that you just installed all the dependent uh, d uh, databases, uh, some uh, frameworks, uh, then you are happily uh, configured and started. So it was uh, the drill to just... Uh, well, I, I think it's very common to many many companies. So uh, nowadays, you could just say, okay, here's the Docker file, or here's the Docker Compose file that uh, defines how uh, more, how more containers or applications should be started uh, together. And you just do Docker run, and you got the applications immediately running. You can uh, try some patch uh, immediately, rebuild it, and yeah, being productive from day one, not wasting the time. Uh, with setting the things that you will not, m may not even need to know. Yeah, and that's my maybe uh, open question. Uh, we had the same with virtual machines, right? You had uh, uh, Vagrant. Who knows Vagrant? Yeah, HashiCorp tool, their first baby. Uh, so, yeah, we had the same possibility uh, with Vagrant, but that's the thing with uh, Docker. What, what it made easier is the uh, like accessibility of this solution. It's so much easier with uh, containers than it was with VMs because anytime you want to start an uh, application in container, you just do Docker run and it starts. If you do Vagrant up, it just takes ages. So you, well, ages. It depends. <laughs> but it's considerably longer and it's a bit more complex to uh, to configure, right? So, uh, so you wrote the application, and then there is a time to test it, right? So, what you basically do is you either create um, the container or uh, container image that uh, should be tested, or you just post the Docker file. Uh, we'll get into Docker file uh, uh, in a while. Uh, so, but uh, for now, you can think of it as a just definition of what should be installed in uh, what libraries should be in in the container. Um, yeah. So, what are the advantages of it? You just um, have some way to build, or you get the build of of the of the application with all its dependencies. Same with same exactly the same dependencies that the developer had on his uh, laptop, which is cool. Uh, so. Why would you like to have this in, uh, uh, in in your CI environment? First, it say it, it depends on your scale, but basically it can uh, save a lot of resources. Not only because the uh, it's it's com considerably sl sl smaller and faster to start uh, comparing to virtual machines, but imagine you got uh, some built uh, system, you got some master and slice, right? And if you want to run Java, you usually have, or build Java, you usually have a certain uh, server for that. Then you have uh, something for Python, something for Ruby. So, but you don't always uh, build all these applications at the same time. So if you have um, 
container-based solution. You can have uh, five, say five, uh, same five hosts, which are exactly the same uh, uh, setup, and you can uh, deploy containers uh, on them. And you don't care on which uh, host it will land, because all the dependencies that uh, container or application in container needs are within the uh, container, right? You, you might need some restrictions if there are some database or uh, NFS connected to, to that, but that's another story. Yeah. And a simple setup. You just have to have host that's capable of running uh, containers, and that's it all. That's all you need. You don't need to have machine that's capable of running Java with certain versions, certain dependencies, and uh, to have a million different versions. So. I think the resource uh, utilization savings are the highest in the CI test. And the second thing is the, uh, you, the, the environment is always the same as it was in uh, development. Yeah. I don't know what I meant by that. Uh, yeah. Unified test and production libraries, that's the same. So, and then we get to deployment uh, phase, right? Uh, and uh, the same same advantage, of course, you get the same libraries dependencies as you had on uh, testing and development uh, stages, and uh, yeah, but you might not want to <laughs> have this uh, f for uh, each uh, environment, right? I'm like uh, talking just about the pros, but there are also cons. So the containers aren't very good fit for microservices and uh, easily scaling uh, services that are stateless and, and stuff. Uh, but uh, if you have, for example, some big legacy application that can run in only one instance, it takes 10, 15 minutes to start up. It's probably not the best fit. If you have a, a production environment uh, for uh, containers usually are okay that some servers will go down, some will go up, and uh, the containers will start on new host and they will recover from uh, failed host because they have they are running in more instances than one. So, yeah. Um, and like, if if you're interested, you're considering, uh, you would like to try containers. Just please don't start with the production uh, containers on their, their own. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> you're laughing, but um, also doing some trainings of uh, Docker, and that's usually some people's people. What some people think immediately, like, yeah, you have containers. I I I started it on my laptop. It works well, so let's run it in production, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, quite funny sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Even though it's production, it's not funny, right? Um, uh, so, uh, if you if you want to run it in production, uh, you don't want to go to server uh, type Docker run and uh, hope that the container will work, will will manage. At least the f first thing you you should run it under uh, some systemd unit or, or some some watcher that takes care of it, but that's just really the minimal. If you want to run it in production and it will be up at least three servers, you should have some orchestrator for that. If you're interested in running it in production, you say just yeah, we know this stuff. Let's let's move on. What will be the next step? Then you're in the good room. Stay stay for it because the next. Uh, uh, presentation is about Kubernetes, which is the number one orchestrator for containers nowadays. Uh, and you will see, uh, and that talk is about Kubernetes in production from uh, Mirantis guys that have a lot of uh, Kubernetes. They, they are basically doing their living on deploying uh, open stack and uh, Kubernetes for production for their customers. So, uh, yeah, they know the stuff pretty well. So, so please, the, the, what, what the take from this slide? Just please don't do Docker run and leave uh, on on uh, production. Yeah, because 
Uh, what I've, I don't know, maybe uh, heard of uh, Build Ship Run. That's the what uh, what Docker started with in 2013. It was like how to build the containers, how to ship them, just how to transport them, and how to run them. But that's where Docker stops. They have some orchestrator called Docker Swarm, but um, yeah. I think number one is uh, Kubernetes, and uh, you should, if you if you are considering production, you should start thinking with that. Or uh, if you like HashiCorp, you should uh, think about Nomad and uh, Mesosphere. Maybe if someone's using MapReduce and Hadoop World, you, you will not meet, meet Mesos. Uh, so these are other orchestrators for uh, containers. Yeah. So if you get into production. You want to know that apps are actually running, healthy, accessible, that they can communicate to each other. You can communicate with them uh, from outside. And uh, yeah, if they fail, for example, you want to make sure that they are started again. That you say, I want to have application, I don't know, web server, and I want to have five instances running on this cluster. And if some node in cluster fails, or if the instance of web fails, of course, you get notification, you get page, whatever. But for the time being, you want it to be started up, usually. So these are problems, so basic problems, that uh, our history service will uh, solve for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I was mentioning uh, uh, right after this talk, there's Kubernetes in production. and. I think this is tomorrow, the Kubernetes workshop. I'm not sure. Yeah. So if you want to get some hands-on uh, <laughs> ex, uh, experience, uh, just try to get uh, your, your spot on, on, a, on this workshop. It's also going to be very good, I think. So everything is clear? Yep, good. Uh, so usually people are like baffled or like annoyed that uh, containers are not healthy. The containers, they, they say that, what, oh, at least what I've heard, uh, like uh, you can you can download anything and run it and it, it has malicious uh, content. Yeah, <laughs> that's like what happens when you download, download random stuff from uh, internet, right? You, Docker or containers in, yeah, elementary will not help you. It, there are certain repositories. If you want to have uh, container images, you can store them in a uh, uh, system called uh, registry. But um, uh, it's not the same like uh, RPM or Debian repository. That, that's verified that everything in there is just uh, uh, healthy or not malicious. They are doing some scans. But it's not 100%. So for example, you got uh, Docker registry. That's the main, uh, the default, uh, default one uh, on most uh, Docker uh, instances. And uh, you can download some thing like Python. You can download Ubuntu. You can download, I don't know, MySQL or Postgres. And these are supposed to be safe, but Anyone can write his own Docker image and can uh, upload it. So if you want to run Docker in production, the thing number two, don't download random image from the internet. Just download some basic image. You can either download uh, Scratch and copy the ISO image uh, into it on your own, or I think they are relatively safe uh, that you have uh, Docker uh, Docker image with Python or with, with only Debian or Ubuntu, even Red Hat it has their own images, and you can verify the content uh, in other ways, right? So, containers and security. Uh, does, does, I think the containers are secure, but it doesn't mean that you can download anything and, and just run it. Uh, so what what, uh, con what uh, containers provide as a security is that it's just a way to run a process, and it's uh, routed and uh, uh, limits your uh, resources. So for example, 
if you have process and someone attacks you, uh, he shouldn't be able to get uh, out of the its own root. It, sh it should be able uh, to be contained not by only root, but by SC Linux. If you didn't uh, so, uh, disable it, it has some uh, reduced uh, uh, capabilities. So even if you are root in container, by default, you cannot mount any file system, whatever. You can edit it, but that's the default behavior, and you can even reduce uh, the uh, settings uh, to, to be more restrictive. You say this container doesn't write anything or shouldn't write anything. It just wants to communicate on, on the network. So uh, you will disable writing to file system, to just disable the uh, capability. Uh, yeah. And why I'm saying uh, resource limitation, just like if someone deploys uh, application, it's fine, but uh, it suddenly starts stealing uh, resources from other processes, then it can kill all, all the processes, not, not only die on its, all, and it's all on its own, and then it's really hard to uh, find a victim, like who was the uh, originator of, of the problem. But if only one uh, fails, one uh, process fails, then you probably know what was the cause. So, yeah. Yep. So I think I covered these. SC Linux, everyone knows and hates uh, and loves uh, SC Linux. And kernel capabilities and secomp. There are some reasonable defaults in Docker or in basically all container uh, containerization uh, uh, runtimes. So you shouldn't care about it. But for example, if you uh, you you create an application for customers and you want to uh, dip, uh, dip, deliver it as a container image, you might want to give them advice on how they should run it so that it it can be run as a root, but it has only. Uh, so many uh, capabilities that uh, that he wants, right? It's, yeah. But yeah, I never had to do it. Yeah. So summary. Uh, I have a feeling I've lost one slide, but yeah, never mind. Um, so what are containers good for? For uh, it's uh, simple packag packaging. So if you want to deploy your application, you don't have to write RPM or Debian packages. I did it as well. It's a lot of fun and a lot of pain. So if if you want to uh, create Docker containers, you just say add these files to this uh, directory. Uh, you you say uh, create this uh, user and grant these privileges, and this is the way you start it. So when you deliver this image to production or to customer, all they have to do is to uh, run command docker run and the name of your image, and it will know what, what it has to do. And you have to, of course, configure it somehow, so you pass in a configuration file or environment variables or whatever uh, you are using for configuring uh, your applications. Uh, yeah, containers are good for applying limits, uh, like uh, resource uh, uh, utilization, like uh, how much CPU time a process can have, how much it can write to disk or certain devi uh, devices, network devices. Uh, it's good, very good for stateless applications uh, on its own. So when you start a container, it should never or it shouldn't really restrict uh, the amount of it writes to disk to minimal. Because once you stop the container uh, and delete the container, it doesn't, it's only process, but a whole root that comes with it is deleted, right? So when you want to have some stateful uh, application, you, you must, uh, well, there are ways with orchestrators, of course. Uh, Kubernetes now has. Uh, the concept of it, but basic uh, containers are good just for stateless applications, right? And if uh, there are any developers not sleeping yet, 12-factor uh, app is a very good uh, set of 12 rules how the microservices should uh, uh, be configured. So I think the containers are very good fit with 12-factor apps. 
Anyone knows both factor apps? Um, yeah. So I think it will always be the same that uh, the stateful applications are not good for containers. Uh, but uh, if you have the good orchestrator, then it takes care of you to uh, when when you basically have orchestrator, it takes care of you uh, of for you of where the containers started, and then it can also take care of like where the NFS uh, disk should be or uh, iSCSI disk should be mounted on which host and which which volume should be attached, uh, and uh, when the containers dies and start start new instance starts on the new server it will remount the uh, nfs for you but it's not the native thing for containers or docker at all so legacy applications that's usually pain like when when you ask what applications can be run in uh, docker or in containers in general it's just 99.9 percent .9 of them but the better question, I think, is what applications should be run in containers, right? It might take a while for you to uh, migrate the legacy application uh, to container. So you should always ask, does the gains outweigh the losses uh, in, this, in this situation? And uh, yeah. yeah, and it's up on you. I, I, I don't have the strong uh, opinion about it. Um, and uh, traditional SQL databases, again, normal containers, no, regular containers. Uh, but if you have orchestrator, for example, I've seen very good demo uh, of how very big uh, company uh, is running uh, multiple Postgres databases in Google Cloud and migrating from their own uh, on-premise uh, uh, data center, and it works pretty well. So. If you have good orchestrator, you get uh, a lot of time or people uh, to, to take care of it, make sure it works, and then it makes sense to move the traditional SQL databases uh, to uh, containers. But it should be the last thing you want to migrate to containers. Because the gain of the containers is you got easily uh, packaged application, you got easily deployed uh, deployable application, and you can easily roll back. So these are the gains for the application you develop. You, you, you can introduce and do the changes uh, rapidly. But where is the gain with the Postgres database, right? How, how often do you upgrade that? So if I can advise, just uh, yeah, in 99%, you, you will not need it. Yeah, if you're running up, uh, database, <laughs> run it in SaaS. Uh, any questions? It's the end of talk. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if my application has some dependencies from private repositories and from GitHub, how should I uh, write the Docker file with uh, some SSH key, private included in it, to download these, these dependencies? Or uh, where should I put the key to download it, them? Yeah, uh, very good question. So you would do it in the CI, right? So the CI needs to have the uh, access to these uh, repositories or uh, art artifacts. Uh, so when you're building the, uh, the Docker uh, container or Docker image, you first pull these resources, and then you do Docker build. And it, on, in Docker build, there is uh, instruction add or copy, and it will copy the files from uh, where you are running the Docker build command inside uh, of the uh, image, right? So that's basically how you do the, I think I had the, I can find, yeah, this is it. So this is how, I don't know why I skipped it. Uh, this is how uh, you create a, a, con a, a container image. You, the first, uh, first uh, instruction is from, from Debian. So you got a, a container image that's uh, Debian. 
and then you can, uh, the, before you started the Docker build command, you downloaded uh, everything into slash app uh, or into app directory. And one instruction says just take the app directory and copy it into slash app in the, in the container. And then you can delete it and uh, do everything. Does it answer your question? I think. I would like to ask about maintainability. I understand that the containers are super easy to deploy, but the idea that every application has all its dependencies and libraries packaged with them essentially seems like go in a huge step backwards. It seems like going back to DLL hell of Windows that every, you know, whenever there is a security hole in one of these libraries, you have to go through all your uh, containers to make sure that it is not affected or you need to rebuild the whole thing somehow. Or, but, you know, isn't this a huge issue? Isn't this, you know, it, a, a big drawback that, you know, you might be, it might be super easy to deploy, but then after two, three years, it's going to be a nightmare? Yeah, excellent question. And um, I didn't have this slide. I totally forgot about the images and the logic behind it. And yes, you're right. If you got uh, some basic uh, vulnerability, you uh, always want to, uh, just fix all, all your images. But the way uh, it's uh, structures, structured is that you got uh, this container uh, image, and it contains of the base image. Then you add uh, some certain layers. But these layers are always reused. So if you have application, I don't know, Python application, then you create a first Docker image, Docker uh, Debian. Then you install Python, I don't know, 3.6. And you name this image Python, Debian Python 3.6, whatever. And then you use this uh, image uh, for number number of, uh, of your uh, applications, right? So uh, when you want to rebuild it, you don't rebuild everything for every single uh, image you have. You rebuild just your base image, Debian image. Then you rebuild all your language-based images, say Java image, uh, Python image, Ruby image, whatever. And then for each application, you will rebuild this one. So the, uh, the thing is that once you uh, build a new Debian image, it, and uh, there is a new, uh, there is a, in hierarchy, another image, depending on it, it will reuse it. It will not do the update. It will just take these libraries that are already updated. And so so this is a very good point. It can become a big uh, hell for you. Uh, so this is where you should really sit down in the beginning and plan how uh, the images will be named and uh, how they will be structured dependent uh, on each other and what is the... I think I'm doing like healthy uh, one week uh, rebuild of all the images. Uh, so when there's a new application on Monday, it always has the newest uh, updates. So it goes through the test and everything. So if anything happens, we know it immediately, but we are on the latest. So definitely something to think about. But there's always a solution for it. Uh, but <laughs> it's usually very simple. But I know a guy from Red Hat was taking care of the uh, images for um, all, all their uh, JSON, uh, or, uh, not JSON, uh, JBoss uh, versions and uh, all the frameworks. And they, I think they've been planning it for like two months at least. And I think they, they found a way to make it as simple as possible. Hi, uh, I am developer and I have a question. If there is any possibility to include applications with UI, for example, uh, I would like to uh, develop some Firefox plugin. So I want like download image with everything, with prepared labs and prepared IDE. IDE. Is it possible to do it with Docker or how is it possible to do it? Well, it is possible if this image exists, but I don't know if it exists for this case, right? So so what is it, what is it composed of? Uh, there is some like image with because I, what I think that in Docker, if you want to do UI, so you have to somehow include the desktop manager. Oh, or you, you mean when you want to uh, test on, uh, like, run the container and uh, see the UI of the Firefox? Yes. Yeah. Like, I the, mean the, something like I would download a prepare a VM image, and it and I and I write like even with sort of operating system or 
like I see the UI of the uh, IDE or uh, well the, the thing is that you don't start the operating system you start just the you can start the Firefox and uh, <laughs> I have a friend who is running his uh, UI uh, programs inside the Docker with all the dependencies just for the, uh, the, this uh, for say Firefox or uh, what are you running? Not, not, not anymore. Yeah, but it was idea or something that it was running inside. But there, there, there's the way to pass the uh, pass some environment variables. I don't know it on uh, from top of my head, but there's a way if you Google or I can Google with you after this session. But it's definitely possible. You can uh, go go uh, inside the image, start a Firefox, and view it from your host view the UI. If this was the question. Okay. And then are you it like through RDP or how is it working? That no, directly. You remember the uh, when you start the process, uh, start a container. It's just a fancy way to run the process. So it's actually when you are outside of it, it's actually a process on your uh, system. So you just need to uh, pass some uh, variables, mount something, and then it works. Okay, it, it can start the. Uh, um, window in, in your operating system. Thank you for a speech. I'm using Composer to manage my dependencies. I would like to ask uh, what is the advantage of Docker over the Composer? Why should I switch to Docker? Uh, what is the advantage of Docker over uh, over Composer. What is Composer? Uh, to manage dependencies. You know, Composer JSON. Uh, I don't think there are ad advantages of Thank Docker you. over Compose. I think Compose is just another Docker uh, is using Docker. So if you have Docker Compose, you can combine multiple images together. So you can say, I want to run web server, I want to run backend server, I want to run uh, Redis, I want to run uh, database. And in Docker Compose, you just uh, specify uh, how these containers will be started, linked, and what uh, volumes will sh they will share, and that's it. All right, so do we have further questions? No? It seems not. So, okay. So, thank you for your call, uh, uh, for your attention, and if you're interested in orchestration, don't forget to stay uh, in this room, and uh, hope to see you in other talks. Bye. Right. Thank you.